Welcome to this new episode at Economics Design. Today we have with us Unju, our Economics Design Analyst. Hi, Unju. Hi, everyone. Today we're going to talk about this new metric that she's created called the Price Deviation Metric. So to get started, let's understand a little bit about that. What is the Price Deviation Metric, Unju? Yes. So basically, the Price Deviation Metric is a statistical analysis on how the market price of a stablecoin token has deviated from its fixed price over time. So we all know that stablecoins have to pack to a fixed value, and the ability of these coins packing to the value, we can actually show that using the price deviation, which is how this price has been different from this pack value and how price has been performing for the past um, historical time period. Great. So basically, it's a way to measure how much price has deviated, and this is relevant to stablecoins. So why is this important? Why do we need this information? Yes. So basically, when, when before this, when we are talking about price or volatility and price uh, changes of stable coins, most of the most of the time we are just using um, simple metrics such as standard deviation of the price and variance of the price. But that metric is actually not very informative because it does not show about the specific trends in price changes and does not show how the behavior how the behavior of the price has been moving up around its um value. So by using uh, the price deviation, we can actually show how if there's any uh, significant trends in how the prices have changed over time. So is it going above or below the pack value more often? And also how how, how uh, average, how long does the price takes to come back to its equilibrium value? And this is an important metric because um, first of all, this applies to all types of stable coins. And, and this is ex especially important for the algorithm-based algorithm -based stable coins because um, most of the algorithm-based stable coins, they are actually using very different types of algorithms in maintaining their um, equilibrium, maintaining their pack value. This actually adds to the difficulty of comparison, especially if we want to compare the stability of different types of um, tokens based on different algorithms. But with this kind of price deviation metric, we can just look at the end result of their balancing actions and deduce if the stablecoin is actually doing a good job in maintaining its fixed price. And this will, this will actually also help us to choose the, the stablecoin to invest in based on our needs and also on its, its ability to maintain at the equilibrium price in the long term. You're saying that this metric is more relevant to algorithmic stablecoins than, let's say, collateral back stablecoin, 100% reserve-based stablecoin, or a mixture of different kind of mechanisms. Can you explain again why, how is it more relevant to algorithm-based algorithm stablecoins? Um, so actually, we can, we can use this metric to uh, apply to all types of stablecoins, but for those stablecoins that are backed with reserve, be it the on-chain assets or the off-chain fiat assets, the information is actually more transparent over there, and we can deduce a lot for a, a lot of quite uh, quantitative information from the reserves. But for algorithm based, um, the algorithms there, um, we can only describe them in qualitative words, and it's very difficult to come up with a very standardized set of quantitative indicators. So if we so so if we're just looking at the price deviation. We can actually, this is actually an easier way for us to make comparisons and also to um, perhaps quantify the ability of these coins in holding onto their pack value. So Understood. this will actually help us to, sorry, uh, this will actually help us to make um, cross token comparisons. And especially um, when we are comparing um, several coins of different types by using this set of standardized indicators, we can get uh, more informative and a more quantitative way of analyzing things. So basically, here we're talking a lot about, we're trying to understand financial risk. And with traditional stable coins or, you know, stable coins that is backed by collaterals, that's non-algorithmic, there's a way to quantify the kind of financial risks in place. Whereas with algorithmic stable coins, it's a bit harder because there are too many moving parts. And at the end of the day, we want to have some area, some way to quantify financial risk. And so you come up with you came up with this metric called the price deviation metric. Yes. Right? So let's move on to the slides and see what else you, you would like to share. And, and a case study. 
how can we use this metric as a case study to analyze a token, for example, FREX token? So first of all, um, this price deviation metric is actually very relevant to our financial risk analysis. And the basic rule of financial risk analysis here is that um, when, this, when the stable coin is more able to maintain to its pack value, th there is actually less financial risk exposure because we see that the price has been revolving closely around the equilibrium, and we don't we don't have to and there and so there's a less chances of a sudden shock, and also the financial risk exposure is lower when the price is able to be put back to the pack price within a short interval. So how so how long does um, each price shock required to be put back to the one dollar point, and how how prices have been performing in the historical time periods. These are very important to our price and price analysis and also the financial risk exposures. And next, um, the data used for this analysis is actually very simple. We just need a time series of the prices of a specific stable coin. And, and this um, time series, it needs to be at a fixed time interval, such as daily, hourly, and minutely. And the minimum sample size here is 50, but we can always bear in mind that uh, the more data points we have, the more accurate result we'll actually achieve. And about the calculations, so first of all, we, we get the list of the time series um, of the price. And from that, we can actually calculate a deviation. Um, for simplicity, the deviation here is just calculated as um, the token price of that time frame minus the one dollar, minus the one one dollar um, pack value. So if the price is going above one dollar at the moment, you have a positive deviation, and if the price is below one, the deviation will be negative. So based on that, we separate the positive deviations and the negative deviations. And we can pull out a simple table of the descriptive statistics to see that if there's any general trend and also the distributions of the positive and negative deviations. And next, we can also um, try to calculate the um, changes between two consecutive time points. So this, so this is a calculation of the magnitude of change in between each time period. And we we'll also take note of the direction of change here to see if the price is being put back to the pack value after a deviation, or is it going, or is the price not put back and still going in a way that is going away from the pack value? And so that's for the explanation, and we'll give a workshop with the example of Frax. And in this analysis, um, we are using Frax because of its complicated and a unique way of maintaining its value. It uses a combination of the USDC reserve and also an algorithm that uh, alters the collateral, collateralization ratio and, and the, which subsequently uh, affects the demand and supply of the FRAX token. So this, so this is a very um, unique combination and we cannot, com we cannot use, um, and because we do not see such combinations in the other tokens, it is very difficult to from um, direct um, com direct comparisons of um, with the other with the other algorithms. So we'll be using this um, price deviation that goes from the results and the empirical price of the tokens. Yep. So this is a plot of the hourly frax price for the past ninety days, and we see that it is um, constantly revolving around what the one dollar pack value, and with some shocks in between. But um, as time gets closer to the current time, um, the deviations is much smaller. And from that, we calculate the hourly price deviation. Based on that um, price deviation, um, we can actually see that um, for 69% of the time, the deviation is positive, meaning that the price of FRAX is actually above $1. And only about 30% of the time, there is a negative deviation. So we can actually see that the, the price of FRAX is constantly going above the pack value, and this could be due to the algorithm that is um, controlling the price, the controlling the supply and demand. And upon a closer look, we actually realize that for time frames with a positive deviation, the 
average positive deviation is actually higher than the average um, deviation when the, when it is um, negative. Um, however, um, the maximum positive deviation is actually much smaller than the maximum negative deviation. So this may actually indicate that the algorithm of FRAX it allows the price to be put it allows the price to be put back to equilibrium um, for with um, so we can actually see that um, for the algorithm of FRAX it is more able to pull back the price back to the pack value when the price is actually higher than one dollar and then the ability of it pulling the price up when the price is not falls below one dollar. So this is an interesting observation here, and because it hints that the algorithm of FRAX actually has different ability in maintaining the equilibrium price at different in different situations, and and also due to the different types of the market shock that the token is facing, the impact of such changes may be different. And next, we can actually look at the directional change of these prices. So an important mechanism of the FRAX um, algorithm is that when the price is positive and in, when the deviation is positive, the algorithm should be able to pull back the price back to one to the one dollar point in the next time frame. Meaning that it is good for the price, it will be a good observation if we see the price decreasing in the next time frame. And so upon analyzing the um, different price movements of each time frame and its subsequent time frame, we see that um, actually for majority of the time, um, the price is able to move, come back to the pack value within the next time frame. So this actually indicates um, very good controlling ability of the algorithm in pulling back the price. And even in, and for the 34% of the time where, time where um, price is not pulled back immediately, it is really pulled back within the next two or three time frames. So we can actually see that um, this algorithm together with um, the supply and demand mechanism and also the USDC reserve, they're actually doing a good job in maintaining the value of FRAX at one USD. So that's for the observations. We see that um, in summary, we see that there's more deviations in the positive directions and the, than the negative directions. And there's a higher, aver higher average deviations in the positive changes but um, less magnitude, but there's higher average deviation in the positive changes. But when we're talking about the maximum, maximum magnitude, it's actually lower when um, the price deviation is positive. And also most of the time, price is able to be moved back to the fixed value in the next hour. And this, is, um, this indicates that FRAX is uh, doing a good job in maintaining its price at $1. Hence, we can conclude that um, from the perspective of price deviation, the level of financial risk exposure for FRAX is actually um, can be considered relatively low. Yes, but um, that's all for the analysis. But um, by the end of the day, we do have to look out for some um, important points in such financial risk analysis. And so, first of all, um, Although the time series data we only requires the time frame to be on a fixed intervals, we have to understand that longer time intervals may actually make the results inaccurate and give us a wrong conclusion on the financial risk. So from for in our analysis, we are using the hourly data, but um, um the hourly data gives a good um description of the price movements for a long time. But uh, if we want to make this more accurate, we can actually um, shorten the time period of data being used, such as we can use um, price data per every 10 minutes and also per minute. And this will actually give us a better um, um, conclusion on how the mechanism of token is actually moving up, moving. And it's also difficult to separate to segregate the impact of shocks and the price balancing mechanism. This is because that the prices of tokens are actually being impacted by many, many factors. So for the case of um, FRAX, it is not just a, uh, it's not just the algorithms, the ability of algorithms in pulling back the price, prices, but also due to the magnitudes of these different shocks in the market or just shocks in the FRAX token. And if you're just looking at the price data, this is something that uh, is diff difficult to di distinguish. 
and we have to always check our results against the actual events that happening in the market to ensure that we are coming up with a fair conclusion. And also, the result is actually heavily affected by the choice of data being used. So for our example, we choose the period of 90 days because it gives a good idea of how the price mechanism has been performing in a recent period. But if we are actually putting, if we put this mechanism, put the time frame to be longer or shorter, the result might, could be different due to the different shocks that is existent in the market. So these are some of the points that we have to consider. And just, sim just similar to all different types of um, this analysis, we have to know our, we, we need to take care of the goals of, of the analysis and always be aware of these issues so that we can actually make um, fair judgments and also to make an actual comparison with the view, view market price data and also our conclusion. Thank you. That's very interesting. I think this is a lot of food for thought for all of you guys to think about. And feel free to get to ask any of the questions in the comments below and just test this idea, test this metric that we are exploring. This is still a very new space and we're coming up with a lot of very interesting metrics to, to quantify the risk, to quantify the robustness of all these mechanisms. So thank you very much, Inzu. And we'll look forward to your questions and we'll answer them. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for staying throughout this entire video. If you're interested to learn more and you want to join the community, do check out our Discord, check out our Academy, and you get to watch these videos for free as well without any ads. And also grab the book that I've talked about earlier on. The book summarizes a lot of what we're trying to build, what we're trying to design, and the different aspects that can be changed during the entire design process. We also just launched Econteric. Econteric is really economics plus esoteric because this space is so complicated and so difficult. What we want to do is to make it easier for anyone to come and learn and be part of this system. So in Econteric, we are breaking down the different analytics and different data to give you more insights, to understand the robustness from a very fundamental level of the health of this ecosystem. So check out econteric.com and I'll see you there. Bye.